Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Debbie Bird Smith, and I'm here with our very special guest, Daniel O'Connor, aka <laughs> the Knucklehead. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can get away with that, can't I, Daniel? Oh yes, please. That's that's what I, I want that to be my title, in fact. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we're just so thrilled. I'm just so thrilled that you could could uh, come on with me tonight because we always have such a great discussion and we have lots to talk about. Um, if anybody's seen Daniel before, you know how passionate he is about the divine will. And if you've ever seen me before, you know how passionate I am about the divine will. So we always, uh, and people in the divine will love talking about the divine will, but we have many things to talk about tonight. So uh, Daniel, if you would, could you lead us off with a prayer and then we'll Absolutely. get into it. Yeah. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the divine will, we come before you, O Lord, conscious of our nothingness and our misery, asking your mercy upon our souls. Please give us the gift of living in your will always, for we give you our will completely and without reservation. And we ask this through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Great. All right. Well, jumping right in. Got a big book about there. The, the, I got a few the, big books in front of me. I, I even got my big Divine Will book right there. Oh, wow. As well. And what's that, the crowd of history, it's, sanctity? Which this, one is one's it? The, this one's the crowd of sanctity, because we, we okay. want to talk about the prophecies of Louisa. I got a few in here. So I actually don't know which one has more words than I. I haven't calculated that, because our, our <laughs> only man bears his image. That's the real fat one. But well, crown of sanctity is really wide, so I don't know. I don't want to say, because, you know, the crown of sanctity is a pretty, it's a that's a whopper in itself. Yeah, yeah um, they're both. This um, one, I have said, you know, you could use this as a weapon. Um, well, both. I mean, you, you need different, a blunt instrument. That's the blunt <laughs> instrument there. Only man bears yeah, the image. Yeah. <laughs> just carry it in your car. <laughs> yes. Just in case. It's true, actually. Oh. The binding of, of just about anything can work as an impromptu self-defense well, mechanism. It, so, <laughs> I, I love this book because um, it's not the kind of book that you have to sit down and just read it. It's it's which which is the, the case with several of your books is really a wonderful reference because we all have questions. We all have things that we need to kind of look up. And, uh, you know, I always say, people say, well, this is, you know, it's taking me so long to get it. And I was like, you know what? It took Louisa a long time to get it. So don't feel <laughs> bad. And Jesus right, right there telling her. So mm -hmm. um, we often have things that we have to uh, uh, reference and we we want to learn more about something comes up in a conversation or a reading or something um, but this one is particularly uh helpful right now because uh we have uh what i consider to be and i think you'd probably agree with me some very diabolical things happening with this whole um ufo uh Lunacy. <laughs> I guess that's, that's what I call it. it. Yeah, that's um, a valid word for it, certainly. And so uh, let's start off there with, mm -hmm. you know, where where did this, I mean, this has been going on for a while, but what do you think happened that it had exploded like this? It was, um, I mean, it exploded like this because this, is, this has been the devil's plan for a long time. And mm -hmm. I think he knows his time is short. Mm -hmm. And the ferocity of his attacks are going to increase in proportion to how short his time is. We're clearly seeing that in the church. We've got this apostasy exploding throughout the Vatican now. And it's the, you know, the think of Our Lady of Akita, Cardinal versus Cardinal, Bishop versus Bishop. As we've discussed many times, that's the, the, the total fulfillment of that prophecy is like right here at the doorstep. You can't, it's hard to imagine more of that than we're seeing now. But also in the world at large, we've got various prongs of the devil's attacks on us. Of course, we have the apostasy within the church, but he's also got his plans for a diabolical deception for the whole world, mm -hmm. facing, ushering in the Antichrist. And we've seen in, we've seen certain major benchmarks, certainly, in what's been going on in the news with the, you know, the you the report in 2017, which first kind of started to get me really concerned that the, that the report about the Pentagon's UFO program, and then 
Uh, fast forward a couple years later, we've got all this crazy stuff coming from the Vatican, and then we've got, um, we've got after that in 2021, I think it was the UFO hearings in Congress. All of a sudden, this thing that just a, several years ago was seen as very fringe is being welcomed into the most mainstream, significant, big, powerful outlets you can imagine. I mean, you, this can't get more significant and mainstream than Congress having these hearings with this guy, David Grush, saying that aliens are here and this ushers in a new era and we don't have to ponder our place in the universe anymore because of the aliens that, I mean, this is decidedly and explicitly messianic, everything about it. But it's a pseudo messianism, of, of course. It's it's the it's a precise messianism that uh, the Catechism says is the sign of the Antichrist that he will offer men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. And it's also exploding now as the whole world is approaching basically the greatest secular crisis you could imagine: the imminence of nuclear war. Yes, we've known for decades that that is like the thing that kind of puts a big asterisk on all of our plans. And yes. it's just really secular analysis right now. You, you can, from the end of World War II onward, this has been the big dark cloud looming over humanity. Will we just completely end civilization as we know it overnight with nuclear war? So when you look at this, these crises in the world, and there's of course a million other ones we could go into, but when you look at these crises in the world coming to a head right now, you can see that we are perfectly primed to, we, I mean, we, humanity in general, to, to just fall on our knees and beg for a savior, but we don't, we're not converting, we're not repenting and turning back to God, the, the only valid place to look to for salvation. So instead, we are creating this, this vacuum uh, of this messianic vacuum that I think will be fulfilled, well, certainly through the Antichrist, but I think the particular deception he's going to use is this ET deception, which has been explained so much in the church too now. Yeah, because yeah, exactly. Because when you start seeing uh, noted theologians, uh, Catholic theologians coming out and saying, mm. uh, you know, well, yeah, you know, we even have one that said, oh, you know, well, you know, Padre Pio, and uh, it, no, 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 no. I, I think honestly, um, and uh, and I know that Daniel writes these books for the good of all. It's not, he's, believe me, he's not making a killing on these books. Um, he's not even making any money on these books. <laughs> but it's for our good because this alien deception is so uh, nefarious. It is, and it's, um, uh, you know, presenting itself because I believe that what's going to happen, I believe that one of the reasons for this, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your opinion about this because I don't know if we've ever talked about this, I think that, you know, one of the things that we, we, we've heard about and we've been anticipating is the warning. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is going to be the explanation for the warning. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, what, be, you yeah. saw, what you saw wasn't real. And it was, it was, you know, some of this alien activity that we've been talking about now for how long and tried to prepare you for because, uh, you know, we knew that this was a possibility and that people are going to completely dismiss what they saw, what they heard, what they experienced, because there must be some simpler, actually simpler explanation than that God came down and showed us the state of our souls, because who wants that? <laughs> you right. know? Yeah, who we wants we're going to be begging for an excuse to write that off. Yeah, who wants that? Nobody wants to right. know that, and it's not going to be pretty. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we can have some logical explanation presented to us, particularly not only by our own government or the governments of the world, because I believe this is a worldwide problem, yep. but our own theologians, our own Catholic theologians, jumping on board and um uh but we must not get discouraged should we absolutely not this is this is part of the plan of god's permissive will he doesn't of course he doesn't want uh in his ordained will he doesn't want any delusion or deception or any of this but this is an extremely important part of his permissive will because and i'm going to do a lot more writing and, and speaking on this general theme in the future but Pro eschatology mirrors protology, protology being first things, eschatology being final things. So mm -hmm. the garden in the garden, we had everything in his will. 
in the beginning. So humanity came forth from his creative hands, perfect, and an original justice, which was living in the divine will. But then what happened? A non-human intelligence snuck in. But of course, we know it was the devil, but he's wearing a disguise of a non-human intelligence, uh, of, of, a, of a, a material creature, a serpent. And what does Eve do? She dialogues with this devil, and then the fall happens. And 6,000 years later, we're going to see the same thing happening in reverse. Mm -hmm. We've got a these non-human intelligences, primarily the UFO extraterrestrial deception, but also the AI deception plays into this uh, significantly. And that is going to be that final test. Just like the, Adam and Eve failed the test, the church, however big of a remnant it's going to be, I don't know. We're going to also be tested through the same basic dynamic of dialoguing with the devil through the disguise of a non-human intelligence that we should have known from what God has already told us doesn't exist. So it's a, it's a we know right off the bat it's a diabolical lie, as I prove yeah. in a thousand different ways in this book. But um, but that remnant that passes the test in the same basic pattern, but in reverse, as we saw in the garden, will enter back into God's will in the yeah. era of peace, the reign of the divine will, the fulfillment of the Our Father. So this this has to infiltrate the church hugely because, well, that's that's the Antichrist's ultimate end. He ultimately, as as Second Thessalonians says, wants to put himself in the holy place, to enthrone himself and claim himself to be divine. And everyone knows, even the non-Catholics know, that the center, the holy place on earth is the seat of Peter, the Vatican. So they're going to want to enthrone an, an antipope there. That'll probably be the false prophet working in tandem with the Antichrist. And it's looking like all oh, that's rather imminent right now. So it, the, yes. <laughs> yes. It, it really does. Uh, it's scary a little bit. But I'm so glad you said what you said because uh, a couple of things. Um, thank you for saying about the permissive will because everybody in all my cynicals knows that my mantra is that everything happens in God's permissive will and it's always for our good. It may not look like it. It may not feel like it. But if he's allowing it somewhere down the road, it is for our good. So uh, please don't ever think that God is punishing you or he's hurting you because he's unhappy with you. It's in his permissive will to bring us to the place of, of conversion, of peace, of of learning to depend on him. And the other thing is, you know, um, people, you know, why is God doing this to me? Well, God does test us. We're not to test him. We're told very clearly right. not to test him, but he never said he wasn't going to test us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and this is one of those tests. This is a very big test because as everything gets, as I say, upside down and backwards, um, this is what we're going to get is uh, even the people that we we relied on, that we looked to for the truth and for uh, learning, for teaching. Um, you know, there's, there's, the evil one is no respecter of persons. He's gonna go after whoever he's gonna go after and, and uh, um, pride, I think that we have to remember that pride is our great downfall. And that if we decide that we know better than God or that we know better than what our own pea brains tell us, I mean, <laughs> you know, then you're going to, you, you asked for it, you got it. And mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the scholars are the easiest to deceive. Don't, don't think you're going to find the truth by just, by just following whoever has the most degrees. As Jesus told Louisa, when I came to earth, not one learned one followed me. Instead, I chose simple fishermen, you know, as my first apostles. And, and, but he's right, of course. Not, not a single scholar followed Jesus in, in his earthly life. And you're expecting that in these final times, you're going to find the truth? Sure, there's plenty of good scholars out there, but don't think that that means anything. I mean, a PhD, a doctorate in sacred theology, that's uh, that can be, that's morally indifferent, of course. But from your perspective, that should be a reason to be a little more careful with that person, not less careful. That, that should not be a reason, oh, okay, that, look at those degrees, I'm gonna trust that person. It's the very opposite. The more degrees, the more careful you should be because the more likely pride has snuck in and dominated that supposedly holy person's. Well, life. you would expect that that would, would shed more light on the subject instead of uh, bringing us into more confusion. And this is one mm -hmm. of the things that, that you know, th this is part of the, of the problem of people that we've, relied on. And so, you know, we can't even rely on the people, I'm sorry, we can't even rely on the people in the Vatican. How are we going to re rely on, you know, whoever? Um, but, you know, I, I, back to this, if this is for our good and we don't mm -hmm. have any reason to be afraid or 
um, uh, a questioning God about this. This is, he, sa he said to Louisa over and over, over and over this. And he said to the Blessed Mother, this is what I have to do. He came to Louisa many times and said, uh, she's complaining because he doesn't show up. And mm -hmm. he says, I can't because you'll keep me from doing what I need to do for love of you. Um, you know, I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to hurt you. But there's things I need to do out there that I can't do if you're begging me you're, not to do them. Right, right. Well, yeah. hanging on <laughs> I love that part. Bad, bad. That's, another, that's another huge point why this is deeply related to Luisa. And it's one of the reasons I felt called to address this is, Oh, goodness, there's so much. But but first of all, of the many private revelations, we can glean the truth from, from plenty of them. Now, this is the test, I'm, I'm convinced, which is why God doesn't just come in and all the time in the most approved apparitions and say, hey, there are no aliens, that's all a deception. Like, this is a test we got to pass by our faithfulness to Scripture and Magisterium. But of all the private revelations I've read, Louisa is by far the clearest that there are no aliens. I mean, as we, as we talked about over on Mother and Refuge a couple of weeks ago, I only scratched the surface. I can only look at a few quotes during the time we have, but there's just dozens of direct assertions in the Book of Heaven that there are no aliens. Yeah. So I could only even include some of them in my book because of how many there were. But anyway, the other thing, Louisa, as you say, she was always holding back chastisements, but but they had they on the other hand they have to happen to a certain degree, and we're always strive we should always strive to mitigate them as much as possible because until they've happened the the scope the severity the duration can always be decreased but they do have to happen and louisa herself was holding something back jesus told her that you're you're holding um certain things back i can hold them back as long as you're on earth but once you come to heaven once i take you to heaven there will no longer be that uh restraint to my justice and she went to heaven, as we know, she died in 1947, which is exactly when the UFO deception started. It started only weeks after she died. And that's one of a number of reasons we, uh, I believe that's when Satan's 75 to 100 years of greater power over the world started. When, um, that's what people tend to forget about Pope Leo the Thirteenth's prophecy there. It wasn't 100 years, maybe. It was 75 to 100. Yes. which is great if it started in 1947 which i'm now convinced it did um that's great because that puts us right now in the period of time right where it could be there. broken we're yeah. right in there it could be broken and yes we, we know we have to endure the antichrist reign of course and i think there will be enormous protection for, for the remnant during that time so don't fear it one bit but um once all that happens we, we could be very very close to the era to the reign of the divine will if we do our best to proclaim it and get it out there and live in the divine will ourselves above all of course but also Get it out there, because as Jesus always told Louisa, like, I, I want to give this kingdom more than you know, but people need to know what they're receiving before I can give it. They need to want it. Like, you, you, we won't deserve it. We're not going to earn the kingdom on earth. We're not going to merit it, Jesus tells Louisa. But on the other hand, I do want people to know what it is I'm going to do so that they can long for it and ask for it. Even if it's only a remnant, we got to get that remnant as big as possible, though. Just like in the coming of the Redeemer, that was also in response to the fervent petitions of the faithful people, the faithful Israelites, who oh, there was always at least a remnant of them that never forgot that God had promised a redeemer. It's the same way now, Jesus tells Louisa. There, there are those who will not forget that God promised what? The even greater promise, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I wanted to note something you said a couple minutes ago, Debbie, related uh, uh, about the, um, the, uh, the warning. And I've written in the past about how I've theorized about some ways that the world might try to write off the warning after it happens, the secular people, about some sort of gamma ray burst. And I think that may very well be it. But if you throw in the alien deception into the mix, that gives them an even better and more convenient uh, excuse. But it's interesting because Protestants, ev evangelicals, have been pretty good in avoiding the alien deception. The Catholics, unfortunately, have been succumbing yeah. even more. Eastern Orthodox, they've also been great at avoiding, at, at fighting against the alien deception. But um, evangelicals, of course, they've got one, uh, a number of, but one of the things they're confused about eschatologically is that they believe in the rapture, which is not going to happen. The, yeah, the scripture speaks of us being caught up in the air. That, that's the last judgment at the end of time. So anyway, they're, they're confused on that, of course. But they see the alien deception as a, um, as it, it'll in part be what 
is used to explain away the rapture. So yeah. they're off on, on what it's going to be used to explain away, but they're right that it's going to be the ultimate excuse to explain away some great act of God. The warning will be the greatest global act of mercy in history. So, of course, they're going to need a superlative way to explain that away. And the ET deception provides the perfect one because the one of the main themes in ufology for many years has been this thing called ontological shock. They're always saying the world is about to have ontological shock when the aliens are revealed. They're, they're, they're hell bent on this idea of ontological shock, which is it's so messianic in, in what they proclaim. But the warning that they're going to claim that the warning was the ontological shock they've been uh, heralding for many years, when, of course, we know that's a diabolical lie. But those Catholics who have been listening to these delusional theologians saying that aliens exist and that they're here, uh, they are really at risk of succumbing to these lies. You, you, you think you're, you're not going to now. You have no idea how enticing and seducing those lies will be. When they yes. are put forth, they will be. So you, you don't fight. You don't look at a temptation and say, oh, I'll be fine. I'll get closer and closer and closer to it. No. As Catholics, we know that part of our very important part of our Catholicism is we avoid the near occasion of sin. Mm -hmm. you, you, as soon as you realize that something's a temptation, you get far away from it, as far, as far away from it as you reasonably can, at least. If you just say, oh, I'll cross that bridge and I get to it about the alien stuff. May, maybe they're here. Maybe they're not. Once they're announced, I'll check it out i'll sniff around a while you've already lost if that's the approach you take we yeah. can't do that we can't do yeah. that because you know I, I one of the things that i i i just feel so strongly about is that uh we need to pray for clarity um uh, in in god's will in the divine will and we will get clarity in the divine will if we're living in the divine will if we're uh because one of the things that happens when you live in the divine will and you're operating in uh in jesus's will and not your own is at some point you begin to get this infused knowledge you're going to have a, a more clarity about what things are on this confusion what i pray for every day is perseverance because <laughs> you know it it could be very scary it could be very confusing but if we're living in the divine will and have been living in the divine will, and Lord knows what's going to happen, um, you know, we have to be prepared and we have to be prepared spiritually as it's good to prepare physically. But we also need to prepare, be prepared spiritually even more than physically so we don't get confused, so we don't follow the wrong path, that we don't uh, get our thinking all messed up of, well, Maybe that is possible, or maybe this is possible. It's really crazy because believe me, they're going to be extraordinarily um, uh, skilled at putting this out in a very what would seem to be a logical way. Uh, although you know, when you th really think about it, are, it's crazy. But uh, many people are following these theologians. Many people, but I'm very encouraged that many, many people are seeing. Uh, and I think this book is really, I think this really, this book has come out. You've, you've, you've done this um, at the most pernicious time because yeah, but... this is when we really, really need to this, this to prepare for it. I know it took you a long time to write this book. Yes. You, know, you put a lot into it, you know. A lot um, of all-nighters. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was, uh, it yeah. was. Writing that book is probably the, one of the biggest crosses of my life, but I'm, I'm very thankful I did it because, yeah, it's um, no no credit to me. I didn't arrange this, but God kind of put that on my heart years in advance. And I had to work on that for almost three years, um, knowing I, I don't know the future, but he knew. He knows the future. And just in the couple of months since, uh, um, I guess, what is it? It's almost uh, just in the three months since it came out, a lot of the things I warned of in there, and I, I've... It, you know, and it's not like I wrote it all the, the night before it came out. I wrote most of those warnings <laughs> long before it came out. Um, and they have been happening yeah. extremely. I had no idea when I was researching and writing this book that certain individuals would come out in full-throated support of this alien deception. And yet what they've done follows almost to a letter what I warned of in the book. Because all you have to do is look at the trends and realize that they're going to continue. It's going to become increasingly fashionable. Who propose that aliens are here and that there, there's going to be more and more theologians so-called so orthodox catholic theologians giving their own exo theologies 
and I, I've got a quote here, and I, I won't waste your time with the whole thing, but let me just, re this is from a, I, I won't bother naming him, I guess, because uh, why bother with that? But I, I if you if you click around and do the research on my book, you'll find out I'm not making this up, and you'll be able to find out where this is from. <laughs> this is a Catholic theology professor at a Catholic seminary. He wrote a huge book specifically on exotheology, which, of course, mm -hmm. is made up. There's no such thing, but exotheologies are these whole new Christian theological systems designed to accommodate alien belief. And they're all diabolical. And there's all there's a million different brands of them. And each each of these delusional theologians who comes up with one thinks he's the first to do it. In fact, it's been done countless times since the Enlightenment. But um, anyway, this, this one came out just a couple of years ago. And this, again, Catholic theologian at a Catholic seminary is saying that contact with aliens will, call, will make us call into question cherished religious doctrines in order to re because we will need to quote have a reorientation of our limited terrestrial belief systems he says for 2000 years theology has had an anthropocentric myopia meaning a nearsightedness he is he's using all sorts of crazy words of an anthropocentric myopia meaning catholic theology he says for 2000 years so he's writing off 2000 years of sacred tradition saying that's been um human centered garbage basically continuing with a direct quote and this is at odds with recent with what recent science indicates he says that discovering aliens he says they do exist is going to make us wholly redefine many of our conceptions of god and creation it will call it will drastically call into question certain christian foundational theological teachings now let me just remind you this guy is not saying this as a warning He's saying this is great. He's saying this is wonderful. Aliens, look, there's aliens, and it, it makes us completely redo Catholic uh, theology. And then he says, "quote It will result in a profound reformulation or recontextualization of theology." He goes on, and those are direct quotes I'm reading there again from a supposedly Orthodox Catholic theologian, theology professor at a Catholic seminary. Let me ask you: Is that a, is that just fine and dandy? Does that sound great, or does that sound to you like a diabolical deception? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what it reminds me is we must pray for our priests and we must pray for our theologians. Please, God, help our, our young men in the seminary because, uh, you know, it's it's a little scary when you think about I mean, it's been going on for a long time that there's been a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, off the chart teachings in the seminaries that have been uh confusing and incorrect and uh, certainly not orthodox but it's it's it gets worse and worse but i i think that we're seeing a lot of holy men come out of the seminaries and and some pushing back and saying no 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 um uh, because uh orthodoxy certainly in the in the traditional movement of the church um certainly seems to be making a uh making a comeback here of people really wanting just the, people just want the truth right. we, we live in a world full of lies lies and more lies our government lies to us even our church lies to us it's it's uh uh it's hard to know sometimes uh w what is the truth i don't even listen to i don't even listen to mainstream media anymore uh, because it's just yeah, it's impossible it to sort it all out. It's yeah. impossible to sort it all out. Um, you know, I kind of seek, you know, through prayer and, uh, you know, uh, trying to see things through the divine will. Let let Jesus sort it out for me. Let Jesus show me what's real and that's will, real. And if um, believe me, for those of you, because I know we have many people that are watching that are new in the divine will, because so many people are coming in. It's beautiful to see how many people are curious about the divine will and and wanting to learn about it, that um, confusion is from the evil one. But don't be discouraged if you're a little confused or it's a little difficult for you to read the readings, because as I said, you know, Louisa, <laughs> Louisa was even, you know, Jesus had to be right there to teach her. Our lady came for 30 days and sat on her bed to teach her. That's you know mm -hmm. how much she needed uh how much she needed this direct um uh direct uh tutoring but uh one of the things that i was wondering about and this is kind of an off the question because i was thinking about this really yesterday when we were talking about um 
you know, what we're going to, what we're going to do tonight. And I was thinking about, and, and, you know, one of the things that I often think about is the, when you think about the remnant, one of the things that comes to mind for me, when I do think about the remnant is the Essenes and um, this, this group of Orthodox uh, believers who, uh, you know, who lived in the time of Jesus um, and they were pretty, uh, they 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 stayed pretty close to the bone, didn't they? Uh, in terms of orthodoxy, and um, uh, didn't get really, I don't think, thrown off track too much by them. Yeah, the, so the Essenes remind me; those are the ones. They were the really hardcore Orthodox Jews of Jesus's time, right? And and yeah, they were kind of the desert. I mean, they yeah, you know, they went off. They they were the ones who said you got to get away from society. And then we mm -hmm. had the Sadducees, were basically like accept all society as it is. They were like the modernists of today's church. But then the Pharisees, ironically, they were kind of like the balanced ones. And yet they were the ones who crucified our Lord. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah. it just goes to show you, uh, you know, anything can happen. Um, mm -hmm. And these were, you know, Caiaphas, these people that were at the time of Christ were absolutely the leaders of the, of the church. Uh, we didn't have a Pope then, of course, because, uh, you know, our, our, but the, they were pontiffs, you know, they were, they the, were pontiffs they, in, their, yeah. in their own right. And right. Caiaphas was, but the Essenes really separated themselves. I guess what my point is, is one of the things I believe that the Essenes did that was so, um, uh, uh, kind of makes me think of what's happening today, is they separated themselves from this part of society. They, they were in the world, but not of the world, even mm -hmm. the world of that time. And I think that, you know, um, in the divine will, we're certainly asked and, and, uh, become painfully aware of becoming being in the world, but not of the world, because we're to live in the divine will and not, you know, the, the world's will and our own human will, which has always got us in trouble. And um, that we, we, we have to kind of just separate ourselves from this. And unfortunately, um, you know, we, we even have to separate ourselves from some of the people that we've wanted to learn from and depend on and, and trust to show us the right way. But this is just all part of the diabolical plan. And coming back to this book, um, God's timing is always perfect. And I believe it was certainly perfect in, uh, in inspiring you to write this book. And also uh, when the book actually ended up getting published, because I can attest to the fact for one thing that many times <laughs> I've talked to Daniel about, you know, having a conversation where he's like, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just writing this book. Um, <laughs> yeah. For those of you who don't know, he absolutely poured his heart and soul in this book because I would say, Daniel, can't we talk about what he's like, <laughs> I'd really like to, I really want to, but I got it. I got to get this book, book finished. And, and there was really a driving force behind um, and, and I just want to kind of give everybody a little bit of a behind the scenes look at <laughs> that this was really an inspiration that that pushed you, that drove you um, to get this done, because I believe, um, knowing who you are and how you are, that you felt this sense of urgency about we need this book and we need it now. I did. Yeah. And 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 and. Uh, it, what a beautiful thing. It just it gets me all choked up when I think about it because God is so good to us to inspire us and push us when we need to be pushed. And, and my beloved brothers and sisters, I think right now we're being pushed and we're absolutely being pushed because as you said, the time is getting close. It is. I think. And don't, yeah. And don't at all, as Debbie reiterated so many times, and I hope you continue to reiterate it. Don't at all, be worried and anxious, prepare, as the scripture says, have oil in your lamps. And that's above all about spiritual preparedness. If, if you just say, oh, I'll be fine. I don't need to prepare. You, you won't be. You won't have any oil left when he comes. Yeah. That oil in your lamps are are the works of charity. They're, they're, it's not talking about literal oils. Oh, there's nothing wrong with stocking up on that too, of course. <laughs> it's talking about the works of charity, building up sanctifying grace in your soul. You know? And above all now, of course, as we know, the greatest grace living in the divine will. So you do these things, but if you're doing these, if you're, and we're all, I'm a knucklehead. I'm failing miserably all the time at this, but I'm trying. And, and if you're striving, 
you don't have to be anxious and worried. As long as you're sincerely striving, you're all, like sincerely trying to do God's will is the same thing as doing God's will. There's no difference between those two things because God is good. And if, because he's so good, he's goodness itself. So if he's, um, if he's good, that means that there will be no situation where you are sincerely striving to do his will, but not doing his will. Because if yeah. that were even possible, it would mean he's not good. So keep doing your best and, and understand that what's coming. Uh, yes, I wrote a big book because, as Debbie said, it's it's a reference work because I'm trying to address everything that I sensed would be brought up in it's these upcoming years. years. <laughs> so that's why, like, but don't think, oh, shoot, I am just... I am just in big trouble if I don't memorize this book <laughs> because it, that's not at all the takeaway here. If you know where to turn to find the answers, if you know that in times of confusion, you open up your catechism and you open up your Bible, if you know to do that, you'll be okay. Like almost every one of these deceptions that are infiltrating the church and the great apostasy or the truly diabolical ones in and in the world with the alien stuff, Almost all of them are clearly addressed in the catechism. Yes. And you can ignore any bishop or priest or theologian or cardinal or even personal opinions of a pope if it contradicts, if they if they decide to contradict anything, so much as a word in the catechism. You catechism must. Wins. You yeah. must. Yeah. Um, because, um, you know, we, we certainly have 2,000 years of tradition and history um, to back up what's been put in that catechism. And part of the problem is, and of course, you know, I always say I'm, I'm a convert. I'm the worst kind of Catholic. I'm a convert. But there are so many people, and it, it, it really, you know, I pray about this because um, we all need to know our faith and we need to know it well uh, because much, much, much of it is being challenged and will continue to be challenged. If you don't have a copy of the catechism, please get a copy of the catechism, make that part of your daily reading. Even if you just read a paragraph a day, something, make sure that you know your faith. And um, uh, I, I just feel like, you know, and you were saying what, if, you, if you're trying to live in, in, in God's will, if you're trying to live in the divine will, uh, even if you mess up, you're, you're doing the right thing. You're doing God's will. And Jesus even says, if you're, if you're not really that familiar with the writings, he says over and over again in the writings, I look at your goodwill. I look at your goodwill. He even goes so far sometimes to say, even if you don't do it right, <laughs> or mm -hmm. even if you intended to do it in your goodwill and you failed, I'll do it for you and give you the merit. I will give you the credit. That's mm -hmm. how much he loves us. And this is how much he wants us to continue not to get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. The Blessed Mother says the divine, the children of the divine will are going to be marked. We're, 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 we're okay. We're going to be okay. Of course you have to, you know, use your common sense, but um, uh, we, we have to just remember that God is on our side. He's not out. He's not out to get us. He's mm -hmm help us. And um, now somebody said, uh, somebody had a question about, do you have an audio version of this book? That would take me about three months straight just to I narrate it. So. Say, <laughs> for goodness sakes, don't ask me that. I, we, won't I, see I, him I, until, uh, we won't see him until July. <laughs> yeah. But so I don't have, and, and you know, I'll, I'll probably come out with something shorter in the future, hopefully the near future that I will have an audio version of. I still haven't gotten around to getting an audio version of I Will Be Done. I, I'm going to do that too. So stay tuned. But um, for the time being, if you if you don't want to read and you'd prefer to listen, Kindle, if you just tell your Kindle or whatever, it, you don't have to, I, you don't have to own a Kindle, just whatever you happen to be reading your eBooks on, whether it's your computer, your laptop, your phone, you can just tell it to read it out loud. And and the automated narrations, they're not the best, of course, but they're tolerable now. They're getting better. So you can just listen to it being automatically good. read if you have the ebook. Good to know. Um, by a computer narrated voice, yeah. Good, good to know. There you go, yeah. Laura. I hope that yeah. that helps because um, uh, as Laura said, some people are dyslexic, some people have challenges mm -hmm. in reading and it's just easier to listen. And- um, oh, I'm the same way. I love yeah. to listen to things. I listen to the Book of Heaven all the time yeah. Whenever I'm doing manual labor or driving or really any task that doesn't need my full mental attention, I'm, I'm listening to the Book of Heaven. And what I have is a, it happens to be a computer narrated voice. So whatever I deal with it, it's the content that's important. That's okay. Yeah, exactly. That's what's yeah. important is the content. And um, 
we need to be reading the book of heaven every day. And, and as you know, some people think, well, oh, it's, it's so big, you know, um, you don't have to read a lot every day. In fact, I think one of the things that I tried to do early on when I came into the divine will was I tried to consume so much of it. I was so taken by it. And, you know, I just wanted to consume so much of it that I was just reading, 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 but I was getting frustrated because I didn't understand what I was reading. Mm -hmm. I, for my part, I mean, you, you can, um, you know, give us your opinion on this, but uh, for my part, it's better to read, um, meditate on maybe not quite so much, you know, you, you don't have to read 15 pages of the book of heaven a day. <laughs> um, yeah. As Jesus tells me, so you got to chew on it. You got to masticate the, the truth. Yeah. So Absolutely. Yeah, and it just you you don't even need a regimen. I mean, regimens are always helpful, but you don't need one. You can just read until you feel until you feel compelled, until you feel till, until you feel prompted to uh, just sit with what you read for a while, mm -hmm. and then you know, just just go go at it uh, naturally and trust that you'll be led appropriately. You don't have to um, beat yourself up over not doing a certain amount, and you don't have to beat yourself up over wanting to do a bunch, and and because just just do as you feel prompted, and you'll it, it'll be it'll be good. Which was how I was always taught to read scripture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I always say, I was raised up a little Southern Baptist girl, and we got our Bibles when we were ten years old. You know, I got a I, girls got white ones, boys got black ones, and you you know you went to Sunday school every Sunday with your memorized verse. Um, mm -hmm. Scripture was very important, and I am grateful. I am grateful, grateful. I will always be grateful for that training. Um, I think I, I wish that we had better, uh, more attention to scripture uh, as Catholics, because so many times, you know, you mentioned, men mentioned Thessalonians, you mentioned um, uh, there's so much in there that really, really is about today. It's really about where we are today. As I always quote the, the scripture, you know, you were born for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. Believe me, you were born for such a time as this. I was born for such a time as this. And I truly, truly believe that, that we are blessed to be living in this time of, I know it's crazy and then sometimes it doesn't feel like a blessing, but I truly believe that it is. Somebody else has a question. Dorothy has a question here about, do you start with volume one? I get this question so many times. Do we mm -hmm. really need to read the first 10 volumes? What volume do <laughs> I start with? If, <laughs> does it, you know, uh, what do I really need to, what, what is really required reading? And, you know, <laughs> people are overwhelmed with, you know, 10,000 pages of, uh, of everything. So what do you recommend, Daniel, in terms of where people start and, well, it's all important, so don't skip anything. Certainly, um, I when I read, I often pick up randomly, just because that's uh, kind of like what I like to do. But I mean, I've already read all the volumes, of course, so I guess that's a little bit of a different question. But yeah, when, when you're starting, everybody has their own theory on where to start. I I don't I, I try not to have a huge opinion on debates like that because I'm a knucklehead. I'm just trying to get people into the divine will. I don't I don't settle. I can't settle <laughs> the debates. I can't settle all the debates of the really holy people in the divine will about all that stuff. But I would recommend starting um, at the beginning if if you can handle the walking with Louisa through these great trials that she recounts. Uh, volume one is mostly autobiographical. She's she's not recounting you know daily messages from Jesus, but it's important to understand where Louisa herself is coming from and and how much she suffered for the sake of this and how much she suffered as a victim soul in. Jesus's preparation of her for this. So yeah, I'd, I'd certainly recommend starting with volume one, but it's also a good idea to have a gist of the message uh, beforehand. So, you know, it's it's always good to have an outline beforehand. If you watch a movie, you probably saw the trailer first, for example. Right. Right. Um, and that's that's what I try to do in my writings. I try to have my writings be just um, previous. They're not either, my, I don't even pretend my writings are like summaries of the divine will or overviews of it. That's not, I'm not even qualified to do that. I'm just trying to, Pushed. I'm trying to shove people into it. I'm just trying, so it's like, I, I consider this book a preview for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that, and, and one of the things that I've said, because I get this question a lot in my cynicals is, you know, where do we start? What do we do? And as you said, we kind of jump in. Now, recently I, I did um, uh, receive the calendar 
Yeah, uh, that's also a good way to do it. And that and it, it's wonderful because these these reading well, Father Sal's has been like get the calendar, get the calendar. Mm-hmm. I finally got the calendar. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Um, uh, now, um. And the calendar meaning you just basically read whatever writings from Louisa's volumes were written on the day. So, you know, today is oh, January 4th. Yeah, you would exactly. read whatever Louisa wrote January 4th of 1920, every- 1911, 1930, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And they are magnificent. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing, I, I, you know, I think The Son of My Will is always a good book to read. Mm-hmm. Um, it really gives you a lot of background. This is just if you're brand new, I, I understand it's it's a lot to take in. Volume 12 is a good place to be because it kind of gives you a little bit a little bit of each end of it um, in terms of the beginning and, and what uh, she's saying later. So I don't think there's any right or wrong way, honestly, to do it. Just do it. Um, yeah. Put your Nikes on it. Just do yeah, it. Just, because, just do it. Right. Uh, you know, um, uh, if you get frustrated doing it one way, try try another way. It's very helpful to be in a in a um, in a cynical. Uh, it was very helpful for me. I I walked in, knew nothing about the divine will, absolutely nothing. They were in the middle of whatever volume it was, and the group, the cynical that I'm in in Florida, or, or where I started in Florida, was formed by Father Young. And he came would come here once a month mm. and teach my cynical. And then he would go back to Tampa for three beautiful. weeks and come back. You know, it was beautiful. And um, yeah, you can still, st- he's unfortunately no longer with us, but you can still listen to his teachings, divinewilllife.org, I think it is. And I yes. highly recommend Father Robert Young's uh, yes. introduction to the divine will. Beautiful, humble man, much yeah. like Father Celso. He, yes. Father Celso reminds me of Father Young a, a lot. Yes. And there's many, many, many resources. Feel free. I'll, I'll put this up. I hadn't thought to put. And this the up. Benedictines of the Divine Will. They're the they're they're just the best. That it's a you know it's an approved religious order specifically dedicated to the Divine Will. Divine you can't will. go wrong with them. So Benedictines and, of the Divine Will. And priests. Um, and priests. Yep. And priests. They're starting um, up in America now. Yeah, they're in Marys Hill, Tennessee, in the Bible Beautiful. Will. And uh, uh, here's my and here is my um, email. If you have any questions or um, want to find a cynical or would like to join one of my cynicals, please just give me give me a a, a shout out um, because I I do them most days of the week. So uh, some in the evening, some in the in the morning, um, because for me that's been the best way for me um, to really sort out some of this stuff, but also to listen to Father Celso and listen to some of these people that we can really depend on to tell us. Um, and honestly, the divine will is an extraordinarily simple, um, beautiful teaching. And m- most of the time, the more profound teaching is, the simpler it is. And so don't let the language or whatever discourage you because it's really very, very simple. Well, um, back to um, uh this, because we have seen the surgence of people uh, coming into the divine will, and we're hearing so much more about it. There's more YouTube channels and more speakers and more days of recollection, all kinds of things are going on. So I think God's plan in that respect is really, uh, is really moving in the right direction, isn't it? He's, he's, he's at work he, and he is, he is really forming his remnant right now. And he's doing that in many ways, but, but, I, of course, believe that the most important and powerful way of doing that is through the divine will. And it, it had, you're right, it's, it's exploding mm-hmm. uh, throughout the world right now in the, in the English speaking world, but also, of course, the Spanish speaking world and various mm-hmm. other uh, countries. It's really it's really getting out there. So God is on the move and the devil is also on the move. Yes. But God is going to win. The devil is on the move because he knows his time is short. God is on the move because... He's got eternity, but he's he's eager to have the kingdom come here on earth. So um, that's only going to happen when enough people are striving to live in the divine will and asking God for the kingdom of his will to come. And when that happens, we don't know the exact day. Of course, that's known to God alone. But when we reach that threshold, it's coming is a guarantee. And, you know, we have here in the title, I, I can't see it on my screen, but I believe the title of the video here that is has the prophecies of Louisa in it. I right? was just going to say, and, let's, let's talk about yeah, some of the prophecies. That's, so like, this is God's uh, providence here is, is unbelievable because the most important prophecy 
in Luis's volumes is, of course, the main theme of them, the coming of the kingdom, the call of the creature to the, you know, the purpose of place, for which it was created by God, the reign of the divine will, the third fiat, the era of peace, a million different things we could call it. But the veracity, the, the, the surety of that prophecy is confirmed by the fact that Luisa also, her writings also, have more already fulfilled prophecies than any other mystical text I've ever read. And, and I'm, I, I'm pretty confident that she, no, I shouldn't say she, because she doesn't know the future, of course, but Jesus did. And G, Jesus' words to her, I believe, contain more fulfilled prophecies than any other private revelation in the history of the church. Um, that's, that's not something I can prove to you right now, but I can just take a look at just a small selection of what, Jesus told her that has already come to pass. I mean, I, I I don't have it all laid out in front of me right now, but I've got Crown of Sanctity right here in front of me as well as on my other screen. I talk about this in all three of my books in the Divine Will. The big one, Crown of Sanctity, the small one, Crown of History, and the medium one, I will be done. But um, in Crown of Sanctity, you can see it starting on, and this is free on my website, by the way, dsdoconnor.com. You'll see a link there in the sidebar to download the ebook of this and it's just a pdf and on page 98 i start talking I, I talk about some of the prophecies that were fulfilled already to remind people that they should have absolute faith in the prophecies yet to come um what i find most interesting is saint hammy well maybe second most i don't know up there is in the prophecies is saint hannibal himself can you, for our new listeners in the Divine Will, do you want to just give everybody a quick heads up on who St. Hannibal is? Yes. Uh, uh, St. Amabel was um, actually one of uh, Louise's uh, confessors, and he was actually, he had promoted, he had started his own, um, uh, his own, if I'm correct in this, Daniel, he had started actually his own um, uh, order. And he was very much invested in this order, and he was doing a lot of work. He met Louisa, became Louisa's, long story short, became Louisa's confessor, really kind of abandoned <laughs> in some ways the work that he was doing in this order, and became extraordinary, just completely devoted to the divine will. And spreading the divine will, uh, you'll find that many times you'll see things maybe in the prefaces of some of the books or some of the things that you see, or some of the quotes and some of the writings of of uh, St. Annabelle de Francia. Uh, he was a very, very, he is a saint. And he was, uh, um, um, I, I don't I don't know when he was canonized as a saint, but uh, I, I don't know what year that was or exactly when that happened, but I do know that he has been canonized as a saint. Yeah. Our, our dear Louisa is a servant of God, um, but you know, we're, we're, we we absolutely have a saint in Annabelle de Francia, and so um, uh, he, he was just so instrumental in in uh, in the messages. And I believe that he's the one that really told her, you know, you got you got to write this down. You know, he, mm -hmm. he, he ordered her actually. Um, and and this is this is one of the places where I just want to just put a little plug in for obedience. Because um, it, it, it very very difficult. It was this was very difficult, um, much as it was for Faustina when she received the divine mercy messages. This really went against the grain. It went Thanks against. Thanks, Lasso. She didn't want to write her autobiography. No, she didn't want to write her autobiography. Saint Teresa of Avila absolutely did not want to write anything. And if you haven't read her or listened to her books, she'll complain about it for the about, <laughs> about every other chapter. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but she did it because uh, these great saints uh, know the value of obedience, and and Jesus talks to us about obedience, doesn't he? In in in, in the writings with Louisa. But anyway, go ahead with the. Um, uh, the well, it's yeah, and yeah. Thank God she obeyed, because we wouldn't have any of these writings if not. Oh, yeah. if, if she if she let a false humility say, "Oh no, no, I'm not going to write," and no, like a false humility can take you away from God's will, just as well as pride can. So. Anyway, um, obedience is a safeguard against both pride and false humility. So is, this is amazing about St. Hannibal, because a canonized saint, if I recall correctly, it was 2004 he was canonized. I could be wrong. Uh, Pope St. John Paul II himself, a saint, of course, canonized Hannibal. Um, the, um, 
the extraordinary thing here is that Luisa had a bunch of confessors, spiritual directors, but Saint Hannibal de Francia was probably the most zealous promoter of Luisa of all of them. He um, he gave his own nihil obstat. So he was appointed by the church to be the censor librorum. So the censor librorum reviews a text and gives it the uh, ecclesiastical seal of the nihil obstat, which says basically there's no heresies in it, nothing nihil obstat, nothing obstructs. And then the uh, bishop can follow up with an imprimatur, saying it may be published, which is also an affirmation that there's that it's orthodox. Um, so the first 19 of Luis's volumes, which gives you the whole gist of the message. So anyone who says, oh, I don't, I only look at approved stuff. Okay, only look at the first 19 volumes of the 36. You'll get the mm -hmm. whole gist of the message in there. And it's all been stated by the church to be orthodox. So don't trust any some, any career lay apologist who thinks he's better than the church. Says, oh, look, this error, this error, this error. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. And, and we talked, anyway, we talked about some of those on uh, Mother and Refuge a couple of weeks ago. But so St. Hannibal says, yes, this, he, he not only gives it his official seal, he dedicates himself to it, as, as um, Debbie said, dedicates himself to promoting Luis's revelations. And the extraordinary thing here is that, at least in my reading of Luis's volumes, I can't recall Jesus ever speaking about anyone as with as much exaltation as he speaks about this ordinary priest. Father yes. Hannibal de Francia, yes. despite Luis having all these confessors and spiritual directors who all were completely uh, convinced of her authenticity. But Saint Hannibal, Father Hannibal then um, devotes himself to their promotion the most. And yet he is the one of all these different priests. He is the one of whom Jesus tells Luisa, do you think that the memory of Father de Francia, his many sacrifices and desires to make my will known, will be extinguished in this great work of my divine fiat only because I brought him with me to heaven? So, and then he says, no, no. So this is right after St. Hannibal died and Luisa is complaining, like he was the one who understood me. So Luisa's complaining to Jesus that she did all the time. Um, Hannibal, he's the one who understood me. He's the one I could really entrust myself to. So Luisa knew to like trust him the most of anyone. Mm -hmm. and and um. Jesus confirms it. He says, no, no. And the, Jesus' words to Louisa, Saint, uh, Father Hannibal, he will have the first place because by coming from far away, he went as though in search of the most precious thing that can exist in heaven and earth. And then he says that who will ever be able to destroy the fact that Father de Franci has been the first initiator in making known the kingdom of my will. So when it, this great work becomes known, Jesus tells Louisa, this is right in the volumes. This is um, February 28, 1928. When this great work of the divine will becomes known, Father Hannibal's name, his memory, will be full of glory and splendor, and he will have his prime act in a work so great, both in heaven and on earth. When did this work become known? Well, there's all sorts of stages in that, of course, but Louisa uh, was declared, her holiness and orthodoxy was declared by her diocese, and her cause was then moved to the Vatican in 2005. So... St. Hannibal, if I have my dates here, uh, anyone can correct me in the chat if, if I'm misremembering, but I believe St. Hannibal is canonized one year before. And Jesus tells Louisa, when this great work becomes known, his name will be full of glory and splendor. And he was canonized the year before. She was, uh, so that's just uh, amazing to me. Is it predicting the glorification? And he was just a lowly ordinary priest at that point. No one would have had any idea that of all of the thousands of priests around there in Louisa's area, he'd be the one. But Jesus knew, of course, because he knows mm -hmm. the future and because these are authentic revelations. But St. Hannibal himself, and I'm focusing on this now because St. Hannibal himself, he only saw, what, about half, a little more than half of Luis's volumes. Um, just on those first 19, he said, in the course of these publications which we are beginning, there are chapters which foresee, and I'm quoting Father Hannibal de Francia here, there are chapters which foresee scourges of earthquakes, wars, fire, cloudbursts, devastation of lands, epidemics, famines, and the like. Everything, everything has been predicted several years before, and everything has come about. And much yet is left to come about. So here's Father Hannibal, now Saint Hannibal, looking at just a just a fraction, just about, and I can't remember when he wrote that. He wrote that obviously before he died. So just a fraction of Luis's writing, saying these are filled with prophecies mm -hmm. that are that have already been fulfilled. And this is a canonized saint saying that about only not even her most amazing prophecies. Her most amazing prophecies are about, I would say, the world wars. 
Mm -hmm. she, Jesus repeatedly, specifically tells her about both world wars. And saying Anibal couldn't see the fulfillment of the prophecies about World War II, yet even not, even not seeing most of the fulfillment of the prophecies, he's saying, this is filled with fulfilled prophecies. So he didn't know that his own, at the aftermath of his own death, he himself would be one of the fulfilled prophecies. But he was. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Um, but yes, when you open up the Book of Heaven and you start reading, um, and really kind of just pay attention to that, they're, because they're just woven, woven through the writings in such a meticulous way, uh, because this is just what this is just what Louisa was living every day, what she was getting from Jesus every day. It wasn't like this great, huge revelation. This was this is what happened to her in all of her encounters and experiences with Jesus and the Blessed Mother. And so but as you look at the readings and you 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 kind of dissect the readings in a way you can start seeing uh, those prophecies just popping out all over the place, particularly after um, you know we we had uh, the writings that happened after World War One or even during World War One, and and Jesus kept saying, "Well, you know, it's it's going to be worse than this." <laughs> well, yeah. He specifically says a worse one is coming. He says that yeah. multiple times, Many and times. you know we we give Fatima tons of credit, rightfully so, for prophesying that. But Jesus told Louisa about the same thing in much more detail repeatedly. Yes. So it's like th this is. And also before Fatima as well, uh, Jesus is, is telling Louisa these things. So you you can't say Louisa just poaching off of Fatima. That's that's not possible. No, uh, I'm, I'm, it's like I'm looking at a message here. Jesus tells Louisa in March of 1927 that there will be another war much more extensive than the last one. And he, he uh, there's I mean there's message after message about uh, August 1927. He says what wickedness after a war. All right, what wickedness. After so many evils of a war they have gone through, they are preparing another one, more terrible, and they are trying to move almost the entire world as if it were one single man. He says that in August 1927. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, exactly what happened. And that, I've got page after page of um, prophecy there on uh, World War II. You'll have to look and you, you can do the research in my book or, or in the book of heaven yourself to find more. Uh, another thing, uh, the the Hague Convention of 1902, and throughout the year of 1902, you'll see passage after passage in Louise's mm -hmm. volumes. She's suffering as a victim soul uh, to prevent the passage of these liberalization of divorce laws. Jesus says, this is a, this is a supreme affront to my church, divorce. Look at where we are today. Uh, yeah. We've got not only the world endorsing it, we've got We've got men in the Vatican saying, oh, yeah, divorce, uh, unrepentant adulterers, they, they're fine. They can receive communion. Diabolical deception right there as well. Um, but anyway, Jesus repeatedly tells Louisa, yep, your, your sufferings will prevent this law. And that's why you hearing this, whoever you are listening at home, you probably never heard of the 1902 Hague Convention. You would have if... Um, if Louisa didn't suffer as a victim soul, because if Louisa wasn't suffering as a victim soul, then this law of divorce, divorce would have been liberalized throughout Europe and, and beyond, probably uh, North America as well, at 1902. But instead, Louisa's suffering prevented it, as Jesus told her it would. And he said, but once you die, this is another thing she was holding back through her sufferings. It said, but once you die, I may not be able to prevent this anymore. And it was a decade or two after she died yeah, that yeah. divorce yeah. was liberalized throughout the world. <laughs> He spoke. At, he spoke about the. Um, I was reading this just today. I think it was about the um, uh, terrible uh, earthquake that happened um, during the time of Louisa, and uh, what I don't. I forget how many people died. It was a devastating, devastating earthquake, and um, uh, you know all of these these catastrophes that were happening. And he and he just would continue to teach Louisa. These are things that must be. Because you know, um, th th this is justice. Um, we have to remember that God is—he's—he's he's loving and He's merciful, but He's also just. And he has to balance the scales because He wouldn't be God if He didn't. He—he he can't deny Himself. He can't just you know. Um, he, he, he can't ignore uh, that His children are going um, down the drain. 
And so divine, because of his great love, his divine, his divine justice in some ways just really demands us. And he tells us to Louisa over and over again uh, in the most gracious and loving ways that he possibly can, not to upset her. I love the way he, he, he tells her because he tells her in ways that he's trying not to upset her. He's trying, you know, he's trying to present it to her in the most loving way possible, but really just reiterating to her over and over, this is, must be, because we, if this is how we have to turn it around. I want yeah. you one more time, because I want to put it up on the screen for people too. And I see it. Thaddeus, up. Thaddeus is a great guy, he's a friend of mine, amen to what you have up on the screen there from Thaddeus, um, that we need this gift not only to hasten the era above all for ourselves, our salvation and sanctification and to hasten the era, but also because of how just unbelievably evil, this is the only thing that you can really rely on to keep you safe, to live completely in God's will. The, the diabolical attacks both inside and outside of the church in the, in the church and the world, you need this to withstand what's coming. Amen to that. But sorry, what were you going to put up? I, I was going to oh. ask you uh, about your um, um, web address again. The, oh, the uh, that's um, DS, dsdoconnor.com. And that's, you can find the PDF of this whole thing for free on there. Um, and I've got a number of uh, other, the prophecies in there. Um, but yeah, the, the justice and mercy, uh, you will never find a more beautiful exposition of both than Jesus's words to Louisa. I mean, it's the most merciful thing I've ever read, but it's also the most just thing. Jesus is very blunt to Louisa about the justice aspect of his will also. Yes. And I, but but he glorifies his mercy even more than anything else I've seen. I like uh, how Jesus, but he does this. Jesus's revelations to Louisa do this: this complete exaltation of both without becoming this compromise between the two. It's because it's, it's never some compromise between two things. No, it's I am completely merciful and completely just. I am both absolutely. And when you brought up the children, what we're doing to children today, and Jesus says when I he tells Louisa when I see these innocent children of mine under the weight of injustice, I am made all fury for their sake. And, and when you look at what is happening to children, I, I won't even speak of it right now because it yeah. nauseates me too much. But um, think about how much that nauseates you. Think about what uh, the response of our Lord is to that. And he tells Louisa bluntly, when, the when, when they are uh, put under the weight of injustice, he has made all fury for their sake. And he tells Louisa, I am meek and merciful and compassionate, but I am also strong such as to crush and reduce to ashes those who oppress the good. And he's going to do that very soon. He's going to crush and reduce to ashes those who oppress the good. So you better not be on that side when that justice rains down because yeah. night is coming when no one can work. So work while you have the light, as Jesus says in the gospel. Um, so many other fulfilled prophecies here. I'm just turning through page and page of them. In the time we have left, I'd love to at least, let's see if I can at least mention, oh yeah, so the earthquakes. We've got, um, Jesus told Louisa specifically that three earthquakes, she was shown three earthquakes. Let me see if I can find it here. Okay, this was April 17th, 1906. You can find it in the volumes there. She was shown earthquakes in three different cities. And she said, it seemed that the earth would open and threaten to swallow cities, mountains, and men. It seemed that the Lord would want to destroy the earth, but in a special way, three different places, distant from one another, some of them also in Italy. Some, so some of three, so one. That's exactly what happened. The very next day, the worst earthquake in Italian history, I think. I'm, I'll have to double check, but I, I think it was. The, I believe. Oh, no, it's I'm still. sorry. I'm sorry. The next, the, the next day was the San Francisco earthquake. Oh, okay. I believe it's still though. I, I it's believe still. The one in Italy is still the worst one. It's, okay, in, in so the, that okay, that one was two years later. But the she, these three earthquakes. So the very next day after that message, the Great San Francisco earthquake struck. So that's you. If you just Google the Great San Francisco earthquake, there's of course been a number. This is the one that'll come up, because this was the. 1906 San Francisco earthquake, it destroyed almost the entire city. 80% of the city was destroyed by this single earthquake and it remains the deadliest earthquake in American history. Mm. The earthquake that Jesus showed Louisa the day before it happened. Four months later, the famous 1906 Valparaiso earthquake occurred in Chile. That was even more lethal. Oh, wow. Three, and then two years later was the huge Messina, the 1908 Messina earthquake, which completely demolished um, the, the city of Messina. 
and killed between 80,000 and 200,000 people. And it's, as you net noted to this day, Italy's most deadly earthquake in history. And Luisa was shown that one the morning before it happened also. Wow. It's, um, it, it's really extraordinary. It is really extraordinary. And uh, God is so gracious to us. He's, he's just so gracious to us. He's given us so much through Louisa that it's really impossible to really to comprehend uh, how much he said to her and how much he's, he's uh, uh, given us in, in terms of, uh, you know, trust me, trust me. Um, Jesus, I trust in you. We had to have this, this trust really um, shown to us and expounded to us to be able to do, to live in the divine will. You know, we're told that our actions, uh, when we operate in the divine will, it has incredible effect, incredible effect that we will never see or know this side of heaven. But we have to trust that because Jesus said it was so, it is so. Uh, when when Jesus said, I always think of that scripture, you will do these and greater things in my name, you know, that they couldn't even comprehend. We couldn't have comprehended. Um, what a great, great gift. Uh, Mary Miles says, wish we had hours of viewing time. This is so awesome and profound. Well, you know what, Mary, we wish we had hours too. And, um, you know, you can, uh, <laughs> but we... We well, don't. I hope you. I hope you invite me back, though. You I'd know be honored to come back. Uh, we, I am going to invite you back, and I'm hoping that you'll you'll kind of be a regular here, because you know we we need you. Um, you you. Oh, are, you don't need me. I'm a knucklehead, but I'm happy no, to help out when I can. No, I listen. what I need is you guys to pray for me. That's that's what I need. And pray for me. Pray for me because uh, uh, you know we're, we're all just what we're all doing here is, uh, and I think I can speak for Daniel on this, you know, we're just all doing what we feel like God has called us to do. And we're all called to work our part, to do our part in whatever way that is. Uh, Daniel and I just happen to be talkers and uh, readers and writers, you know, we're kind of uh, nerds in that way. <laughs> yes. uh, we're, a little, we're a little nerdy when it comes to reading or whatever, but but we all have our, our um you know, someone said to me the other day, I don't know how to explain the divine will to anybody. And I feel really bad because I can't ever explain it. And I, and I always tell people when they say that, watch Daniel O'Connor's uh, The Divine Will in 27 Minutes. I love that little video. It's a great one. But you know what? Some of us maybe aren't called to talk about it a lot, but we can pray and we can, you know, we just keep offering your acts. Keep it up, keep offering your acts because these acts that we don't understand what's happening are doing wondrous things. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why the divine will is growing is more and more people are offering our acts. And didn't Jesus tell us that, you know, we know that he knows the exact number of acts that has to be done and the exact right. number of people that have to be in the divine will for this all to come to fruition. So we just keep, we just keep at it. And Daniel, I'm just so grateful that you're, you know, willing to take time away from your um, brood of children upstairs. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got to go say goodnight to them before you their bedtime. And, and to give them a blessing. I promise but, uh, you, you can say goodnight to his kids and uh, yeah. before he goes on to the next thing. Um, but no, I, I just amen to what you've said, because it's, it is so important to proclaim this. Absolutely. As I'm always saying, and as I said, even today, but also don't forget the flip side of that is that Jesus says that the most power, Jesus tells Louisa, and this is reiterated in many other uh, mystics and, and other places, that the most powerful things are actually the hidden ones um, where no one knows about them, but you and God. Those are the most powerful things for um, for hastening the era, for, for building up treasures in heaven, for mitigating chastisements, the things that you're doing between you and God, suffering with trust in his will. Uh, offering everything to Jesus, offering everything to him, trying to um, truly live in him without ever being thanked or praised for it. That's the most powerful thing before him. So if that's who you are, if that's what you're doing, if you're a, if you're a, just a humble housewife or menial laborer, just, just trying to do everything in union with Jesus, or if you're in a hospice or a nursing home or, or just lonely and no one visits you and you have no one to talk to, uh, but you're trying to pray, 
as much as you can and offer up your sufferings, you're actually the most powerful people. And like on, on Judgment Day and in heaven, like it will, it will mean absolutely nothing how many social media followers somebody has or how popular their books are. That'll mean nothing. You mean um, my all, Instagram all... followers <laughs> wouldn't mean anything? Oh my God. No, I mean, it, it, what it will, all that will mean anything is how much we're striving to do God's will. And for those who are called to, to do that, yes, that'll be important um, uh, tangentially. It'll be it'll be important, important yes. as, as an aspect of doing his will. <laughs> but in and of itself, all that matters is doing his will. So um, you are, whoever you are, even if no one knows, even if you're the least popular person on the planet, you are probably more important for the coming of the kingdom than I am or, 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 or Debbie or, or, or the president or the Pope, yeah. uh, because it's, a, it's, a, it's, those are the most powerful things you and God, and we'll all see it on judgment day. When that I'm, time comes. I, I am but, nothing. I am nothing. I, you know, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm just a Catholic convert that happened to have the good, uh, grace uh, to be brought into the divine will, which I consider an extraordinary gift. And, but we're all called, every one of us who are in the, and living in the divine will, we were called, we were called by God. He chose us. And, uh, and, and along with that comes, you know, our work and whatever our work is, you know, who was it that was, uh, was it Mary Taiji or who was it that said, that left the priests in the hallway when they came to her for advice? And she said, I'm yes. sorry, I'll feed my kids first. And I I'll believe, give oh, yeah, she would leave cardinals in the hallway. Yeah. Even to, so, yeah. I'll get to you later. I got to feed my kids. You know? Exactly. Made a mistake showing I think up that was her. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Well, let's um, yeah, to do God's will. <laughs> let's just end with a prayer. And brought us in. can you take us out with a little prayer? Well, and let's just, Keep it real simple. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. amen. In the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, I thank you all, everyone who's watching, everyone who will be watching this on uh, on tape, then watching it later. And uh, please, you know, look up Daniel's uh, website. I, I strongly recommend that you get this book um, if you want to learn more about this uh, situation with the alien deception. And uh, God bless you all and stay uh, in his will because that's... Uh, uh, that's where it's at. <laughs> That's where it's at. Amen. That's where it's God at. Bless you. Thank you for having Thank me. You. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah.